to Recovery Dialogues, an Avenue for Culture Change in Psychiatric Hospitals. My name is Oryx Cohen, and I'm the COO, the Chief Operating Officer of the National Empowerment Center. And we are very excited to have this webinar today, an important conversation and a difficult conversation. Um, so I just wanted to mention before we went on that um, I myself have experienced uh, hospitalization. So I have, I have a vested interest in this conversation. And I also have a dear friend who is currently in the, the Worcester Hospital. And actually how this work um, got started at the hospital was um, advocacy that I was doing um, with this person uh, at the hospital and an administrator there at the time who's no longer there um, took my concerns very seriously and we had um, very good conversation and one of the results of the conversation was to begin these recovery dialogues at the hospital which you're going to hear all about um, and we're hoping that this uh, hopefully can be repeated other places across the country. So thank you everyone for joining us for this important conversation. I, I wanted to go through some housekeeping before we get started. Um, one of the uh, most common questions is, will this be recorded? And yes, this this session is being recorded, this webinar is being recorded, and the recording and the PowerPoint presentation will be available on our website, uh, powertoyou.org. Now, this, this is kind of a special webinar in that we are um, attempting to use a webinar format to have more of a dialogue. So, uh, we have designated about a half hour at the end of the webinar. Uh, it's really more than a question and answer session. Uh, we want to hear from you any questions you might have, your opinions, your comments. Um, but to do that, you can use the question function in your dialog box uh, and, and basically type whatever you would like. And we will uh, address those comments and questions in the order that they're received. Um, if you could also kind of identify your role when you um, are using that function, that would be great. Um, you, you know, where are you from? What's your role? What, what, what do you do? Are you working with a hospital? Are you a peer? Um, we would like to know that if you feel comfortable and. Um, in the first presentation, uh, Dan is going to be talking about what is dialogue. And we hope that when you are using this question function, you can keep the principles of dialogue um, in mind. So today's agenda, uh, again, I'm your moderator, Oryx Cohen. Um, we're gonna hear from David Dvorsny of SAMHSA. And then Dan Fisher, Jackie Ducharme from Worcester Hospital, and then a few others from the hospital, Valerie Comerford, Patrick Whalen, and then we're gonna have a dialogue. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to David Devorny, who is the chief of the Community Support Programs Branch at CMHS SAMHSA. And we'd like to thank SAMHSA for um for funding and supporting uh partially supporting this this webinar so thank you thanks works i really appreciate that and uh you know thanks uh, just to explain a little bit where i'm coming from um we are the part of samson that's the substance abuse and mental health services administration one of the uh, agencies within the federal department of health and human services um, and SAMHSA is focused uh, on improving um, uh, the mental health and substance use disorder 
um, system across the country. Uh, I work in the Center for Mental Health Services, which is you know, it's a big shock. We we focus on mental health services, um, and uh, um, I specifically work in the section of mental health services that is concerned with um, programs that uh, are meant to build community supports for adults with serious mental illness. So, um, with that, I'm I'm really excited about today's webinar. You're going to hear about the implementation of recovery dialogues in uh, Worcester Hospital in Massachusetts uh, and their work with the National Empowerment uh, Empowerment Center towards uh, that goal. And uh, recovery dialogues are a model that engage providers, families, consumers, and other stakeholders in respectful dialogue. And this dialogue strengthens relationships, improves outcomes, and fosters collaboration within the hospital. So I, I think it's a really interesting topic, and I'll hope you find it to be informative. But I, I did want to mention uh, uh, that uh, the National Empowerment Center, um, they're being a little bit modest. They have a lot of other really important work. Um, so uh, I wanted to mention that briefly. Uh, they're one of our consumer and consumer-supported technical assistance center. They provide technical assistance to advance consumer-directed approaches um, uh, in two regions of, of HHS, the region that's kind of in the, the northeast of the country, as well as uh, the upper Midwest. Um, they also provide technical assistance nationally on crisis response, and they, uh, they do work uh, like the work we're going to talk about today. Um, and they've been working um, with the Worcester Hospital uh, now uh, on this uh, for quite some time. And so I, I think this is really important. Um, and one reason I, I think that this is a really important initiative um, is uh, because uh, one of the things we see here at SAMHSA is that change is really hard to implement. And SAMHSA's goal is to implement change across the healthcare system to improve behavioral health care. And um, so we see a lot of attempts to create change. And one of the hardest things about changing systems is culture change. So really um, changing from, uh, from administrators to, to staff to people participating in systems um, to you know, community partners, um, changing that entire culture um, to, to be some more, more supportive of effective practice. And in this case, to be more supportive of uh, consumer involvement and kind of recovery orientation. And one of the most powerful things we can do to promote culture change is to create personal connections. And that's why I think this is such an important um, uh, method of doing that. Uh, these recovery dialogues really create those connections. And, and I, I think this is really important because it shows that there are active steps that we can take to help providers and others move towards a consumer-driven recovery orientation. And uh, this is really important because it gives people purpose, not only people in systems, but also for staff to know that they're helping people on the road to recovery. It really can empower them in their roles as well. And so uh, just very excited about this webinar, and uh, I hope that uh, you get out as much uh, get out of, get as much out of it as, as I hope to, and I think we will. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dan, uh, Dr. Dan Fisher, to hear more about the recovery dialogues. Thanks so much. Thank you, David. Um, again, we really appreciate the support of SAMHSA on this webinar. And um, I want to introduce our next speaker, which is Dan Fisher, who is MD, PhD, and uh, a colleague and a coworker of, of mine. He's the CEO of the National Empowerment Center. Um, he's also someone who has recovered from a diagnosis of schizophrenia. So he is a psychiatrist and person with lived experience. Um, he received his AB from Princeton University, his PhD in, or oh, sorry, his BA from Princeton University, his PhD in biochemistry from the University of Wisconsin. He carried out neurochemical research at NIMH for five years. He has published 12 chapters and three chapters on scientific research, um, obtained, obtained his MD from George Washington University. Board, he is a board certified psychiatrist who completed his res residency at Harvard Medical School. Um, and he also was the one um, consumer survivor member of the President's New Freedom Commission. Uh, so please, uh, Pleased to welcome Dan uh, to present. Well, oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Art. Thank you, David, uh, for this great opportunity that uh, SAMHSA is presenting us. Um, and I, I wanted to start off by saying, um, just uh, similarly to Art, uh, I have a personal stake in this, um, in this particular topic, uh, because um, 
prior to becoming a psychiatrist, uh, I myself was diagnosed with schizophrenia and hospitalized on three occasions. And um, during those hospitalizations, I, in fact, felt there was a need to improve uh, the care in the hospitals and especially around communication uh, between uh, staff and clients. And um, so I, I sort of vowed to myself, I'd become a psychiatrist and try to change the system uh, during one of my hospitalizations. And I did, after I got out, I went to George Washington Medical School and, and did get a, um, uh, become a psychiatrist. I found, however, it's not so easy to change the system. And just as David was saying, I think the most difficult part of systems change is culture change. And I, I think it's because we all sort of hold on to what we're familiar with. And um, so I've, uh, I was reflecting with uh, Rx that um, in my you know, almost 40 years of practicing as a psychiatrist, um, I've, had, I've also been a strong advocate and uh, helped start the National Empowerment Center uh, from a, uh, the perspective of people lived experience. So I'm going to go, uh, so I've, I've been internally trying to work out this dialogue uh, for many years. And, um, and hopefully we can go beyond the either or. Uh, and that's really the message I'd like to get across. And that's the message of dialogue, that we can get beyond the either or. Either it's the way providers see the world or it's the way uh, people who have lived experience see the world. We need to find a both and uh, somehow in the future, and I think dialogue offers that. So um, I'll start with a brief history. Uh, my first mission is a brief history of the consumer survivor ex-patient movement. Um, and uh, it started uh, in, in 1969, this sort of uh, US version of it, uh, out in Portland, Oregon. And then in the early 70s uh, in Boston and San Francisco, and the early names uh, of the organizations that were first founded tell you that the first sort of voice of our movement was a voice of protest. And uh, we had the Insane Liberation Front that worked against psychiatric assault. And uh, a group that I was personally a member of, the Mental Patient Liberation Front in Boston, um, we were in those early stages just trying to be heard. We were outside the institutions, sometimes with uh, uh, signs saying uh, nothing about us without us when we were feeling very much uh, not heard. And um, also during that period, there was a period of separate separatism. <clears throat> Although I was um, eventually um, uh, became a sort of provisional or a, a friend of the Mental Patient Liberation Front. When I first applied um, to become part of the Mental Patient Liberation Front, uh, and I felt I needed to be part of that while I was doing my psychiatric training at Cambridge Hospital, um, I was told I could come as a ex-patient. That was the designation then, but I couldn't come as a psychiatrist. And um, I was kind of hurt by that. And, um, but it was a period of separation. So they formed a group called Friends of Mental Patient Liberation Front. And that was what I was a member of starting in about 1978. And my good friend and mentor, the late uh, Judy Chamberlain, really sort of guided me along. Uh, she wrote a, a book on our own in 1978 that really laid down many of the principles of our movement. And at that stage, <clears throat> the major principles were being against uh, certain uh, activities of the system, against forced treatment, against um, uh, the over-reliance on medication, against lobotomy, against ECT. And um, there wasn't yet uh, a sense of what we were for. We knew that we wanted alternatives. And the first alternatives formed uh, we're in the early 80s, and On Our Own of uh, Baltimore was probably the first uh, peer-run program. They called them uh, social clubs or drop-in centers. In 1984 in Cambridge, I helped start with Judy, the Ruby Rogers uh, drop-in center. And um, then in the uh, middle 80s, in 1985, it was a sort of a, 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 a watershed um, the federal government for the first time funded 
uh, an activity of the this uh, new movement, and that was the Alternatives Conference of 1985 in Baltimore. That was the first uh, federally funded Alternatives Conference, a national conference where um, we people lived experience could come together and share our experiences and our uh, our knowledge and network with each other, and that's continued. Um, on a uh, annual basis um, up through uh, 2017. And at that point, uh, starting in 2018, we've continued um, without federal funding, we've continued the Alternatives Conference because we feel it's so important. Um, the, the 1990s were a period really of um, uh, starting to be involved in the system and uh, being in the decision-making, uh, invited to be on the various boards and decision-making bodies. Um, we started to get involved with uh, supporting employment, education, and the major principles starting in the, uh, the 90s are the principles of the recovery, it could be called the recovery movement, uh, self-determination, protection of rights, decreased uh, discrimination, um, Nothing about us without us, always there. And in the early 90s, uh, uh, Joe Rogers, Susan Rogers started the um, a National Self-Help Clearinghouse in Philadelphia. And um, myself and uh, Patricia Deegan and Judy Chamberlain um, and Laurie Hearn started the National Empowerment Center uh, in Lawrence, Massachusetts. And uh, these two were fed, uh, federally funded uh, by SAMHSA as, to, to provide um, really uh, assistance in how people could recover and also give people hope that people could recover. We were run by and have been continue to be run by people lived experience because we want our voice to be heard. We want our experience to be shared very much as women started the uh, Stone Center for Women at Wellesley uh, College. And we started out more on the academic end, but in 2002, um, the, uh, under President uh, George uh, W. Bush, uh, there was a new Freedom Commission. And as Oryx mentioned, uh, I was chosen as the only person with lived experience um, to uh, represent our community on that new Freedom Commission. And um, we, we really educated the other 14 commissioners continuously every month that we met. Uh, through emails, through testimony, through uh, my sharing, uh, my own experience, uh, my own recovery experience. Recovery was something that was still very new to most of the practitioners and the other four psychiatrists on the commission were in disbelief at first that this was really possible. Um, but by the end, uh, they agreed to adopt a mission statement that we see a future where everyone uh, labeled with a mental illness will be able to recover a full life in the community. And that that recovery, trans that transformation to a recovery-based system will be led and uh, driven by people's lived experience and their families. Um, it wasn't, it hasn't been so easy though. You can, you can have a, a grand report and a grand um, set of ideas, but to actualize it, takes uh, really more advocacy. So uh, I and a group of people started in 2006 a uh, national um, voice for people who have experience called the National Coalition for Mental Health Recovery. And that is the entity that um, sponsored the most recent um, alternatives conference in 2018. So this, this culture change is uh, something that, um, that, that, that we're trying to do at all levels of society. Um, Ron Manderscheid, formerly of SAMHSA, now uh, head of the commissioners for uh, the county uh, counties of, um, of the country, uh, has recently said that all the innovative uh, changes in the mental health system the last 25 years have been due to the efforts of people with lived experience. And he particularly uh, cites that the concept of recovery, and we really mean not recovery from an illness, but recovery of a full life. Um, was really the, uh, it was really motivated, it was really developed, the ideas behind it, the principles behind it, um, from our lived experience of recovery. 
and also the peer run programs, especially um, uh, respite programs, uh, peers being part of warm lines, crisis, peers working in hospitals, which we'll hear from um, uh, shortly. All these innovations uh, came about because of the efforts of people lived experience. Um, it, hasn't been, it hasn't been easy because when you've been labeled mentally ill, you're really told that your voice doesn't count. So we have, through the Empowerment Center, developed a program called Finding Our Voice, which um, has been particularly active in California, but we've also done it in Massachusetts and in Florida. And that is really to develop the voice of people with lived experience. So we have all these, they have all these ideas about we want to transform the system to recovery. How do we go about it, though? And um, this gets back to the culture change question that David brought up. And um, we've, we've given talks, we've written papers, we've been on various panels, we got it into the commission report, but still the culture has remained more, um, more of a maintenance culture, more of the idea that once you're labeled um, you know, with a severe psychiatric problem, the best you could do is just maintain yourself and, and not necessarily uh, develop a full life. And unfortunately, this is still, um, people are still told this. I, I work as also as a psychiatrist and I see um, just too many parents and people uh, live experience who uh, they, the parents and, and their, their young adult have been told that um, their son or daughter, maybe in their 20s, won't have a full life, won't be able to get married, won't be able to um, uh, hold down a job. And this is really um, a tragedy. So how can we change it? So in 2008, I heard about this idea that was actually taking hold in business of uh, dialogues, uh, people engaging in dialogue. And these dialogues were developed by a physicist of all people, David Bohm, in the 70s and 80s. And they were ways of trying to expand people's point of view and to go beyond your ordinary, um, uh, just uh, own world. And, uh, and in parallel with this was the development in Finland, a small group of psychologists developing open dialogue, uh, helping families to see different perspectives. And, and this idea, that the, the language of it is that most of us are often trapped in our own world, which we call monologue. And that the goal of dialogue is to expand those monologues, expand them to uh, encompass other points of view. So there are just a set of, there's a, a set of a few principles. Um, and what we do in these dialogue groups uh, we call them recovery dialogues, is we gather in a circle, that's very important, because equality, you try to establish, at least for that period of time, maybe an hour and a quarter, that during that period of time, the equality of our humanity supersedes particular roles that we might have, um, doctor, nurse, uh, patient, um, uh, family member, that these are secondary to our humanity. So that um, if we look at the slide here, it shows us that um, we have uh, all these the different people, 15 to 20, gathering together. And Val will talk more about how this has been taking place in uh, the Worcester, um, uh, Worcester Center, um, Center uh, Recovery Center and Hospital. It, um, it, it's, it's, it is a hospital, but it's a hospital that's aiming towards recovery. Um, so these, um, if you look at the next slide, we'll go through these uh, <coughs> elements of dialogue. And the first is that we encourage everyone to use their authentic voice. And that's, that's really from your heart. You're, you're, you're not just the voice of your cognition or the voice that you ordinarily use, but the voice of, that encompasses feelings as well, and that's our deepest voice. And um, secondly, um, the, we try to listen together. Uh, next slide, please. Um, listening together means that you can listen um, to another point of view, and that when you speak, you speak 
uh, as a listener also. That you're, 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 you're framing your speech um, so that it can be heard as much as possible by other uh, people. And that when you're listening, you suspend your own preconceived beliefs. And um, this means respecting, and the next slide uh, really covers this, respecting each uh, person as a whole human being. And that's where the equality is so important here, um, that, that we, we really value differences. The, the second part of respect, and the next slide talks about that we see differences as sources. Uh, next slide, please. That we see differences as, um, as a source of, um, of strength, not something to be um, uh, marginalized. And this is very important to people of uh, different ethnic backgrounds, people of different ages, people of different uh, sexual orientation, all have something to offer. And the uh, fourth and the next slide goes over the, uh, uh, the component of suspending our own belief. And I'll just give you an example that's for myself. Um, uh, although I'm trained as a biochemist, neurochemist, I'm trained as a psychiatrist, my own lived experience has all, always made me very much want to emphasize the human development, the human element of connection. And um, this means that sometimes when I hear someone, you know, speak, you know, like, oh, these are just chemical imbalances, and, you know, people should just take their medication, and that's, that's really all you need to do. Uh, inside, I, I get rather upset because I know from my personal experience that although medication can at times be helpful and um, uh, that there are certainly chemical changes that occur, that it is heart-to-heart -heart communication and heart-to-heart -heart understanding that I think ultimately uh, is the most uh, healing. Uh, so I've tried to learn to listen well uh, because I don't want to invalidate another person's point of view because then I know that they won't really hear mine. So we try to listen uh, to someone we speak and, um, and we choose uh, not to defend and not to enter into debate, um, but to really try to uh, understand what another person is saying and try not to just be overly uh, into our own perspective. This is probably in some ways the most important. The next slide goes over the fact that we really try to create a trusting environment so that people can share heart to heart and open up. And this actually I'll say a little word at the end about emotional CPR. This really is the, the heart to heart communication is what we develop uh, through emotional CPR because a lot of it's nonverbal and a lot of it is itself a great challenge. And the last slide is also a great challenge within a hospital environment, and that is the importance of equality. Um, and though each person has different status or position, um, we say that uh, they leave their hat at the door and come in without the symbols of power. And the next slide is uh, just a, a summary of all, the, uh, all these different uh, components of recovery. And uh, you see on the right there, uh, this illustration is very nicely done by Maria Osteinberg and her staff. Leave your hat at the door. Leave your rank, your status, your position at the door. So you come in, um, you come in really as a an equal, and you can see here we call this also we CPR. Um, it's a a way to share. You can't really share heart to heart if you overemphasize the power differences. So that's that's uh, those are the principles. We hope we can employ them today. And um, I I will just briefly say, and Val will go into this in greater detail that Arx and I, um, uh, this, this uh, venture at the uh, Worcester um, uh, Recovery Center Hospital was um, started by Arx really visiting a friend who was a client there. And uh, through that, he got to know an administrator, just shows that personal relationships are so important. And this administrator got Val involved, and Val had already been doing with me 
uh, recovery uh, dialogues I want to actually mention that she and I started these first um, over about a four-year period in a community mental health center called Riverside. So we started monthly uh, recovery dialogues there in the community uh, to help the clinicians to see a different point of view. So when she came to uh, talk with uh, this administrator at the hospital, she already understood and knew and had experience with recovery dialogues. And we thought that'd be a good place to start. And we set up a big meeting and uh, about 50 personnel from the hospital. Sounds like a lot of people, but there are 1,200 employees, I believe, in the hospital. So, um, and from that, started to do recovery dialogues, which had a, um, a shaky start at the beginning, but, uh, and Val will go into that. Um, I want to say one other thing, and that is that our, our, Ultimate our goal, next stage goal is that we will, um, we very much want to uh, uh, bring emotional CPR training to the hospital um, and the hospital staff. And we have done this in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico's had three trainings at a uh, psychiatric hospital there, which has also been very helpful in the post um, uh, Maria hurricane period. And um, and I was just in Poland, and this, this emotional CPR is, is taking place in many different parts of the world, actually. And in Poland, a psychiatrist attended the presentation on emotional CPR and said this should be taught to all hospital staff. And the reason is it's about connecting. Emotional CPR, as, uh, as David was mentioning, connecting is so crucial. And if we can just connect, and they, um, as equal human beings in this, this vast unknown that we all live in, and at least find each other, hear each other, feel and sense each other, then I think we can together um, make this transformation of the culture, not only in the hospital, but in the community as well, uh, away from maintenance and towards recovery. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thanks, Dan. Okay, so before we hear from the folks at the Worcester Hospital, um, I'd like to just add to that, that when we we had this, this plan to do the recovery dialogues there, and we, we didn't really know how, how that was going to, to shake out. Like who would, would people come, who would come? And when we had this initial presentation with these initial dialogues, it was really quite amazing. There was there was about 50 total staff that attended. We split up into two dialogues, and and they represented really all aspects of the, the hospital, from administrators, um, psychiatrists, social workers, counselors, peer uh, workers patients all sitting in a circle and and I was also a little hesitant because I was like well will people really speak what's on their mind from their perspective and they really did people spoke from the heart and um, from their perspective and, and had a really uh, really good conversation um, and that has continued and you're going to hear more about how that has continued um, at the hospital um and some of the impacts that this is having uh so first i'd like to uh, turn it over to um jackie ducharme who's the chief operating officer at the worcester hospital um jackie um thank you very much um i think you can do the next slide oh no so before we get there um, again, my name is Jackie Ducharme, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Worcester Recovery Center and Hospital. Um, over 25 years ago, uh, when I first learned about the meaning of recovery, um, a client uh, let me know uh, that he wanted staff to fully understand his goals, his dreams, and his hopes. And he wanted a real dialogue with staff and others. And uh, that really made me appreciate that we had a long way to go. 
Um, and as um, Dan shared, it has been a process. And when I learned about the recovery dialogue, I knew that we wanted that here at Worcester Recovery Center and Hospital. And it was very clear that the recovery dialogue exemplified recovery and wellness, which is obviously based on mutual respect and understanding. The Worcester Recovery Center and Hospital leadership endorses and promotes the recovery dialogue as a sustainable initiative that we know will help promote a culture of safety and respect. And without further ado, um, I'd like to turn this over to Val Comerford and Patrick Whalen, who can share how the recovery dialogue has impacted um, a cultural change shift in this facility. Thank you, Jackie. And Thank you. We, we, yeah, we appreciate your leadership um, in, in making this happen. Um, so uh, Val and Patrick, would you like me to read your, your bios or do you want to introduce yourselves? Um, how would you like to do this? I can, I you can, can definitely- You can go ahead and introduce this if you'd like. Okay, great. So we're gonna hear from uh, Val Comerford and Pat, Patrick Whalen. Uh, from the from from their perspective uh, on these recovery dialogues that have been happening. Um, so Val Comerford is the director of recovery for the Central Massachusetts Department of Mental Health. Val has worked in and been part of the mental health system since 1993. She was director of Crossroads Clubhouse in Massachusetts for 23 years. An early pioneer in the peer support movement, Val openly used her lived experience of mental health and addiction recovery in her work before it was fashionable to do so. She demonstrates a willingness to tell a story when it's helpful for others to hear. Val is a strong leader and advocate for Dual Recovery Anonymous. In her current position, Val serves as the Director of Recovery for DMH in the Central Mass, Massachusetts area. She provides support, consultation, and supervision to both the community and hospital-based peer workforce. She also provides peer support at the Worcester Recovery Center and Hospital Dual Recovery Anonymous Group, ERA. And Val was trained in recovery dialogue by Dr. Dan Fisher in 2008. Uh, Patrick Whalen is a peer specialist at the Worcester Hospital. He's um, been involved with the mental health system since 2010. His first exposure to the system was through several instances of receiving hospital care and then utilizing community services after discharge. In July of 2014, he began his career as a peer specialist. He worked at Advocates for the first two years of his career and then went to work for the Department of Mental Health um, at the hospital where he is still currently employed his skill set is based around supporting young adults, dual recovery, WRCH's deaf services, and the recovery dialogues. So welcome to you both. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. So why don't we get started with our first slide? So as Dan said, um, I was trained by him when I was working for a mental health organization called Riverside Community Care. And there were probably 25 or 30 people in this initial classroom where we learned to understand the impact of recovery dialogue. And we left that class and we set out, we started three recovery dialogues in the community. Some had great success, some had minimal success, but the ones that were successful were ones where there were strong leadership components. So I would say that having strong leaders, real champions of this dialogue is essential to the success as we move forward with trying to implement some of these, whether it's in a hospital or in a clinic or in the community. Next slide, please. The dialogues 
that we constructed in the community were comprised of clinicians, program directors, family members, people with lived experience, clubhouse members, and we would gather every other week for about an hour, and we always had two facilitators, co-facilitators, and we would select a topic ahead of time, and we would start the dialogue by sharing on a recovery component. And from there, we would invite the rest of the group or the rest of the participants to share what they had to say. And there was never any pressure to participate. Sometimes people came just to listen. As Dan and Oryx mentioned, in September of 2016, I was hired. I, I left the uh, private nonprofit and came to work for the Department of Mental Health. And in my responsibilities, I, I had responsibilities in the community and responsibilities in the hospital. And I knew right away that recovery dialogue would be a good match for the hospital because I saw how um, it affected change in the mental health clinic that we had been working with when I had the uh, recovery dialogue in the community. So I, I spoke to Jackie Ducharme and I spoke to the previous administrator who had uh, made a connection with Oryx and we talked about well, what can we do to make sure that recovery dialogue get introduced here. So both Dan and Oryx came here as they mentioned and did what uh, I called a presentation and demonstration. So that's what a hospital would need to do is to have people come, give a presentation about this subject and then to do a short demonstration to break into groups so that people can practice the dialogue to get a feel for how it's different. Because some people come into this thinking that it's like a form of group therapy, which absolutely it is not. Next slide, please. I was given permission to start recovery dialogue shortly after Dan and Oryx came, but the problem in the very beginning is that administration thought that it would work best on one of the hospital units. In my heart, I knew that this was not the way to go, but it was so important to me, I was willing to give that a start to get started. I said, okay, I'll let it get started on a unit because I wanted for people to know who I was. And if just a couple of people could experience what a dialogue was, I thought I could grow some champions. So I conducted the dialogue with uh, another person in the peer department. Next slide, please. From October 2017 till about January 2018. And we had very limited success because of the narrow scope of people who could attend. So I, I walked away from it knowing fully well that I had to regroup. I got some new champions, such as my friend Patrick, and we said, well, we've got to find a way to do this hospital-wide where people throughout the hospital and people from the community could come to these dialogues to experience what it felt like to be in a room like this. So um, that's what we did. We found that there was one space in the hospital that felt very open and advantageous to conducting a dialogue, and it was the chapel. The chapel here at Worcester Recovery Center and Hospital isn't your typical chapel. It has chairs that you can put in different sized circles. So if you had 10 people come, you could make a circle for 10. If you had 30 people come, you could comfortably make a circle for 30. The windows are very brightly colored. It's a sunny room. It's easy for people to get to. It's not, it's not like in a restricted part of the hospital where people can't come and go freely. So we started it, next slide please. We started it um, in the chapel and the first week that we had it, we probably had less than 10 people. And I felt a little discouraged because we really, really did do what I thought was a good job, advertising and marketing. But I had friends who said, Val, be patient. So I remained patient. I worked with Patrick and the rest of the peer services team, and we did some more marketing. Next slide, please. We 
we went back to the leadership team and we said, we need you to help us to get more people to even know about recovery dialogue. It's not like you can hang up these big posters promoting it. We needed the benefits of recovery dialogue to be spread by word of mouth. And that's what we did. We, had, we, we made friends with people from the psychology department, from psychiatry, from human resources, from social work, from training and development. I made friends with the campus police and I met the chaplain here at the hospital. His name is Mike. I had never met him before. We met people from the rehab department and mental health workers. And once we were able to make friends with people from different departments, they brought more friends. And those friends brought patients. So before we knew it, we went from 10 to 33 people. And that was the highest number we've ever had. And we've had 33 people a few times, I would say our average is about 24. And the, the way we're able to get people to keep coming to dialogue is by making another friend. And that's a friend that I have in the administrative department here at the hospital. And I ask her every other week, Cindy, can you please send out the reminder email? So she sends out the email with the flyer on it. And we post like six or seven future dates. So if someone can't come that week, they can mark it in their book to come another time. So having that administrative support personnel is extremely important. Next slide, please. You know, we talk to new employees through orientation, and when new patients come into the hospital, we talk about recovery dialogue there. Um, I think that's all I have on that slide. Next, please. One of the, um, and Dan mentions this in the, um, there, there is a, uh, a list of steps involved in setting up successful recovery dialogue that Dan created. It's about 12 different steps. And in the steps, it says that you need to have champions. And champions are people that not only will attend the recovery dialogue, but will encourage other people to attend recovery dialogue. And we have uh, following uh, four or five different testimonials of people that we've asked to be our champions, and they were kind enough to write something that we want to share with you right now. So Patrick, could you read these, please? So the first one was written by Devika Paul. She's one of the psychologists here at the Recovery Center. And she wrote, because this facility is so large, one of the best things about recovery dialogue has been getting to meet new people and putting names to faces. Feel reminded that each of us has a story, whether we're giving or getting services, and that having a context for a person's life can help me be a better provider and colleague. Leaving our hats and titles at the door is a great way to help us learn about people without first focusing on what they do or who they are in the organization. And most of all, I really like that as a group, we share some laughs and a lot of common experiences. Next slide. And this one is written by Tara Callahan. She's the uh, assistant COO of for, uh, for the hospital. Um, so for me, the experience of participating in the recovery dialogue has been completely positive. And I'm thankful for the experience. Being new to WRCH, the conversations allowed me to learn and connect to all who attended in a way that would not normally be possible. The sessions provided an opportunity to come together and get to know others on a personal, humanistic level. I was provided the opportunity to interact with people as a person and not as administration. Next slide. This one was written by Ben Matthews in the psychology department. Recovery dialogue has given me the opportunity in my busy work day to give me an extra moment for introspection and connect on a very human level with people I have the opportunity to sit with and next to every day in this hospital. The topics discussed are always helpful for further reflection and help remind me of the various reasons why I strive to be a better clinician and person in general. Next slide. 
I, this one was written by Julie. Now, Julie was a, a, a friend of mine who worked at Riverside, so I knew her from a previous job. And, and again, that's just to point out the importance of having strong relationships within the hospital environment in order to help this to grow. She says, I appreciate the presence and mission of the recovery dialogue in this hospital because it gives space for meaningful and powerful exchanges that otherwise wouldn't take place in standard treatment groups. The dialogue fills an important gap by acknowledging and removing the barriers that get in the way of developing a more authentic coming together about recovery and healing. It allows for there to be shared human experience without the labels of patient and staff, which feels incredibly empowering to witness and be a part of. Next slide. And this says it all. This is from Megan Mooney, who is in the rehab department. She's an occupational therapist. And she says, when the larger hospital community at times can be lost in the demands of documentation, deadlines and meetings, recovery dialogue gives me permission to stop and make the essence of what recovery is a priority. Recovery dialogue is a space, a community really, where I can connect, reflect, and ground myself and what is important. I get to be vulnerable and share my empathy in this community, which only helps to strengthen my relationships. In turn, my fellow Recovery Dialogue champions do the same, creating a bond and sense of camaraderie that expands beyond the walls of the dialogue to the everyday interactions throughout our busy days. Through Recovery Dialogue, we build a true sense of mutual respect, understanding, and compassion, and I bring with me wherever I go. Next slide. My first experience with recovery dialogue took place in the community um, not too long after my last hospitalization. And it was really, uh, really my first exposure to an intentional conversation surrounding recovery. And this was the meeting that was established at the at Riverside Community Care, which was previously mentioned. Um, so I was someone who still identified with the system labels at the time. And again, like I had no concept of recovery. And this was really the, uh, I learned about it through Crossroads Clubhouse where that was the director at the time. And uh, that was like really my first experience receiving services beyond therapy as well. So this was just me just diving right into the community mental health uh, world, essentially. And I don't know, I think I, I think I was about 20 at the time, so I was still in that transitional age there. And uh, so this was a lot to take in. And uh, so I'm just very fortunate that Val invited me to attend that recovery dialogue because it was the first time that I really saw people um, at the clinic um, who were in clinical roles. Um, and not necessarily all clinical roles, but just everyone there together and being able to interact with them in a human way that, that um, you know, was kind of outside the norm of my typical interactions with the clinical staff over there. And uh, I felt equal and I felt valued and, uh, you know, just kind of nice to hear um, the broad uh, perspectives that existed within that room on recovery so that I could, like, really learn a lot and be able to kind of start a foundation there. Um, really my next experience, I went through a period of time not really having recovery dialogue relevant um, throughout my life um, after uh, after having moved on from the Riverside. Um, the, yeah, so, so the Riverside meeting, uh, it wasn't relevant for a long time. And then the, my next exposure to it was at uh, WRCH after I had started working here uh, next slide. Um, so a little bit about my experience with um, the presentation here, though, is that it was really nice to see coworkers and people that we support here all come together and really learn about recovery dialogue for the first time. And kind of, I noticed that people had a similar experience that I did to my first experience with recovery dialogue. And uh, I saw uh, fellow coworkers that I work uh, side by side each day, um, kind of share things 
uh, from their perspective that otherwise wouldn't come up in everyday conversation. There's just really a good way to prompt that discussion and learn more about each other. And also, I think it was a good opportunity for people that we support here and the other staff that work here to hear from each other as well and be able to connect and improve their relationship, um, particularly, you know, nursing staff that are on the unit um, all day long and, you know, they, they see each other every single day. So I think it's important that we're able to have this dialogue that can improve the way they interact with each other and, and along with myself. It was really helpful for me, too. Um, and after that presentation, there were certain people who were really enthusiastic and looking forward to having that established here. And uh, so I thought that was really helpful. Um, so after the presentation, um, Val, um, after you know some of the behind the scenes work, Val was able to come to the peer services department and really talk about um, what the vision is and kind of was keeping us up to date on really the groundwork and kind of, uh, you know, kind of helping us have a clearer picture of what was going on. And then eventually, like whenever it was actually established, um, she invited me to co-facilitate the recovery dialogues and kind of beyond my own experience attending them, Val was able to kind of support me individually in learning what goes into that facilitation process. Um, kind of the way Val and I have kept it going throughout our facilitation is that um, afterwards we'll kind of discuss ways of improving the recovery dialogue. So after each dialogue, we'll debrief, talk about, you know, kind of what went right, um, things that we could work on. Um, just an example is like, we'll discuss maybe, um, you know, kind of at the next dialogue, how can we open it up in a way that, you know, we might emphasize that having silence is okay and that's important to allow people to gather their thoughts. Um, so that, that's kind of an example of what we discuss is like, in what way can we improve the way we open up the next dialogue that um, creates more comfort. Um, also, as a result of facilitating dialogues, I've also been able to meet other staff, develop new relationships and build rapport, whether it's new rapport or rapport that already existed. Next slide. So in terms of the peer services department, um, we all contribute to, to the recovery dialogue, um, you know, whether that's supporting people and learning about it. So um, often whenever we talk about, you know, the fact that it exists, um, <laughs> you know, we'll kind of, of course, explain um, more about it and kind of be able to share our experience from that peer perspective. And so we offer it as a resource and whenever we put the, um, the knowledge out there, we leave it up to the person to decide whether they feel they would benefit from that. Um, so we really want to support their self-determination with that and uh, not necessarily push our own agenda. We don't want to push the agenda of it, but we just want to be able to have people make an informed decision and then just hope that they can benefit from it. And uh, often that has led to people being interested and kind of the, the part about helping people get to the dialogue is that there are times where someone might need a staff to go off the unit. So that's just something where we would coordinate with a person and, uh, you know, kind of figure out what works best for them with how to um, get off the unit and go down there if they need any support with that. Um, so our department really tries to focus on the mutuality piece, which I think is just inherent in the nature of recovery dialogue with leaving our hat at the door and being there as equals. And uh, and although we're not there in our role as peer specialists, I think just um, our human experience of um, receiving services or, you know, having a diagnosis and going through the system, that's naturally going to come up in our stories. So I think to a certain extent, even while we're in recovery dialogue, we're still functioning in a peer way because whenever we're sharing authentically, it includes our our, our actual stories. Next slide. So as a whole, we've also been able to connect with other disciplines and, uh, and, and I think that's been really important because I think, um, you know, kind of, well, even as long as the peer services department has existed in the hospital, like whether it's like through 
new employees or just kind of maybe staff or disciplines or even, you know, just people staying here that we haven't interacted with a lot. Um, it's fairly new still. And so I think it really helps um, to have some mutual, we can have, you can value each other um, and appreciate each other more whenever we kind of learn about, um, you know, what our contributions are and like what we, how we function here. Um, so I think whenever other disciplines and vice versa, we get to know each other and kind of learn what we do. Um, you know, I, I think it can really allow others to appreciate the peer role too, um, because with a little bit of education, I think it can make a huge difference in recovery dialogue facilitates that. Um, so next slide. And uh, so how what contributes to mutuality in recovery dialogue is uh, we speak from our own experience. Um, we feel that being authentic promotes mutuality and suspends judgment. Um, there's mutual give and take whenever we're listening to someone share or they're, or we're sharing our experience. Um, we allow equal space for anyone who would like to share and we all learn from each other. Next slide. And so the outcomes, um, we, we hope that there's a general sense of, you know, we're in this together. Um, we either build upon our existing relationships or develop new ones. Um, you know, it fosters hope, which I think is the most important piece here. And, uh, you know, we can support each other. And it's really a continuing opportunity to better understand and promote recovery. And that's our portion. Wow, thank you so much uh, for that that wonderful presentation. Um, so at this point, uh, if you're muted, you can unmute yourself. I looks like um, the presenters are are unmuted. And what we're going to do for the next half hour or so is really try to have a, a recovery dialogue right here through through a webinar, which is. Um, a challenging medium, but I think we can we can do it. Uh, you, you've learned what a recovery recovery dialogue is. We're going to try to use some dialogue principles in having this conversation. Um, just to give you a little perspective, there's about 160 people who have attended this webinar. There are lots more interested in it, and I'm sure we'll be interested in the archive. And you're you're from all over the world. <laughs> I, I was going to say all over the country, but we have um, someone from Australia who is tuning in as well, and maybe from other countries as well. Um, and you're in a variety of roles, a lot of peer specialists. Um, I've heard from some social workers, uh, providers um, on this webinar. So um, let's get to the conversation. The first uh, comment I'd like to read is from Brenda Vizina, who's actually from the Central Mass Massachusetts Recovery Learning Community, peer-run organization here in Massachusetts, and they run a peer bridgers program at the hospital. Um, and she, her comment is short and sweet, and uh, props to you guys at the hospital in terms of, uh, she says, embracing peer workers has been wonderful. And uh, I agree that uh, as far as a hospital, um, you're, the amount of peer workers that you have there and embracing that um, is great. So that's what uh, Brenda says. Um, and by What's, the way. Uh, what are peer, peer bridges, uh, Rx? Well, I don't know if someone from the hospital wants to talk about the peer bridger program, but uh, the peer peer bridgers are, are folks that come in from the community, uh, peer workers from the community who meet with patients at the hospital to really serve as a bridge so that when people um, leave the hospital, they have somewhere to go. Um, 
and uh, they have a support system in place when 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 they get out. Um, so I don't know if does anybody at the hospital want to say more about the peer bridger program? Uh, yeah, so I can speak to that a bit. Um, so I co-facilitate one of the uh, we refer to it as a peer discussion, but we have a peer bridger from the Kiev Center come in to co-facilitate with the peer specialists here. And uh, so just to kind of summarize, like we want to the peer services department wants to support peer bridgers to form relationships with the folks who are staying in the hospital um, so that the bridger can uh, support the person in bridging, um, you know, to support in the community, like whether that involves uh, the Kiva Center. Um, and so kind of like we try to work in tandem with that. So for example, like we uh, internally, the peer specialists um, will kind of connect uh, folks who are staying here with the peer bridger from Kiva and hopefully can treat, uh, can create, um, a, a, I guess a consistency of relationships. So whenever someone leaves here, um, like whether they're on a pass or being discharged is that they've already developed a relationship with the community. So that whenever someone leaves here, they're not just left on their own and that the peer support uh, continues. So we, we kind of do our best to work hand in hand with that. Helping people move from a restrictive environment to a less restrictive environment, you know, requires relationships both inside the recovery center and outside the hospital uh, recovery center to, to be strong. Oh, great, great. Now we have a really good question from, uh, I'll just read his statement. Uh, my name is Reggie Lee. I'm a peer support at Unity Hospital in Portland, Oregon, and I've lived experience with multiple hospitalizations. I also run four hearing voices groups. It has been the most trying thing to work at a hospital and hear the constant stigmatizing language and viewpoints. How can I move towards building relationships with providers in such a fast paced work environment? Hmm. So, so um, this is Jackie Ducharme. So really leadership needs to play a role hmm. uh, in your facility. And I don't know what your relationship is like with the leadership, but um, they also need to endorse the work the peer specialist does and begin to promote with you and other providers what it means, uh, what recovery means, and how it can be achie achieved. It is not a fast change, it is a slow change, but you need leadership to engage with you in moving it forward. Yeah, this is uh, Dan Fisher. I, I would agree with that. I um, I remember when I first went to work at um, Riverside uh, Clinic, um, and although that was outpatient, um, I, I also worked at Denver State Hospital. So I um, and I I have lived experience. I I found it. I did find it difficult to hear some of the uh, comments of people that you know had not been accustomed to working side by side with uh, people lived experience. And um, I, I just, I, I tried to get to know them. I tried to, you know, form relationships and then, and then just sort of gently educate that, you know, that it was painful. It was painful to hear that kind of description and, um, and, and, and not in a overly accusatory way, but just in a, try to, to do it in an educational manner. And the other thing that I found helpful was to not do it alone. When you go into a new a situation, to have um, other, to have a support group of your own too, to uh, with some other workers. Um, because when you're doing systems change and culture change, um, you need you need to be able to sort of step back and support each other uh, in your own point of view and your own experience. So it 
it, it, don't go alone, I would say, is, is another, another important point. It has to be a partnership. Yeah. And the last thing I would add to that, because I, you know, I was coming from the community to work inside of a hospital system of which I knew nothing about. And I knew that in my role as a peer specialist, that part of my job is to be a change agent. But I also knew for change to take place, I had to first develop relationships yeah. and to build trust. And the, the, the trust has to go both ways. You know, Jackie needed to trust me and I needed to trust Jackie. And, and how I express change in this type of a system um, and even in the community, is that I keep my foot gently on the gas. And every mm. now and then, the traffic clears, and I can put the pedal to the metal, and a lot of change will happen very quickly. But most of the time, I have to gently keep my foot on the gas mm. and, and just keep moving forward. Mm. But I don't do that alone. So I, I wish Reggie good luck as Reggie builds uh, – relationships and collaboratives within the hospital that they're working in. Good luck to you. Yeah, and also um, as a peer specialist working in the hospital and um, kind of having the experience of, you know, hearing stigmatizing language and kind of how I've approached that just kind of like in my everyday work is uh, I think role modeling, kind of the language that, that, that I feel is more respectful. Um, but, and, and also just being able to share um, and not make it necessarily like uh, adversarial, but, um, you know, I might share that, um, just an example, for me, I like to describe my experiences with my mental health as experiences, like sort of rather than using the term symptoms, like I might explain like why um, the term experience feels better to me. And so I think often I might approach um, other types of stigmatizing language in the same way is because uh, I think just on a human level, like I might internally feel frustrated, but also I recognize that in a hospital environment or just any professional environment, or I guess in any environment in general, but kind of being able to approach things in like a diplomatic, non-adversarial way. I think it, um, I think collaboration and uh, Putting myself in a position where another person can validate me it kind of opens up um, an opportunity to embrace a new perspective, particularly whenever that new perspective is just simply being respectful. Um, so yeah, I think role modeling is a huge part of it. Great. So um, I'm just going to keep going through in the order received. Um, this next one is I am the facilitator and violinist for Me Too Orchestra Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia affiliate. How can I and peer musicians help change the culture for peers and hospitals we play music in? Any suggestions? Thanks. Jen Garrison, CPS. That's um, this is Dan. Uh, and here in Massachusetts, they have a group called Tune Foolery, um, and I'm a supporter of their activities. And um, it's uh, people lived experience who are musicians who go to various um, uh, facilities to sort of educate through music. And um, I actually had them on a TV show that I was uh, doing several years ago. And so they they play their music and tell some some of their story and then play their music again. So it, um, it's a nice integration of um, of their music and their story. And it, it I think the music uh, that they play together is very supportive um, for each other. And also it's a nice medium to sort of lead into um, a somewhat sometimes more difficult conversation. It's sponsored. I think it's sponsored by the state and by contributions. They have one coordinator and they have about 50 musicians and they get a small stipend when they play the music. Yeah, and I, I would just say that um, bringing music 
into a hospital is is culture change uh just by the act of bringing music in um i think there's there's also ways that that you could um collaborate you know uh be involved with the recovery dialogues be involved with the initiatives that are at the hospital ha um do some speaking in addition to the music so bring in bring in your perspective um you know while you're performing and thinking about how you want to do that um, hopefully with support from the administration of the hospital so th those are some some ideas one one other thought um i i agree with you a lot um at worcester recovery center and hospital we have a strong music program and actually they did research and uh their program is now seen as evidence-based practice and that um, where there's research that it has a real positive impact on individual recovery. And I have no doubt your group your, uh, can absolutely uh, work with the hospital in providing a really important service. Absolutely. Hmm. Okay, let's um <clears throat> we have we have an, a comment from Jen as well. She says uh every hospital I've been in has had a culture all its own depending on staff attitudes and stress levels as well as the amount of support staff feels they're getting from their employer. Just my observations. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know if any, anybody wants to respond to that, but that was a a comment. Um, then, uh, we have Christine Joving from Boulder County, uh, Colorado, I think, um, role as a wrap, a wraparound family support partner, hired for her, her personal experiences. Um, uh, Tom Grinley from uh, New Hampshire is on and asks, he's actually the uh, from the New Hampshire Office of Consumer and Family Affairs. He asks, what is the length of stay at WRCH? How do you keep a dialogue going if the participants are always turning over? Hmm. Well, some here and stay for different periods of time, some longer than others. And there is, it, it's not necessary in a dialogue to have consistent attendance, but it certainly is nice to have a core group. And we do, we probably have seven or eight people that come every single time. And then the others come and go depending on work schedules, vacation schedules. And then of course the patients, they may need to go to some other group for a particular reason, or they have an appointment outside of the hospital. Um, so it's not necessary, you know, every week, every dialogue is a new experience. And even in that one hour meeting, you can develop some new relationships that can help to improve your stay while you're at the hospital. Okay, great. Uh, then we have uh, Stephen Daw from Virginia uh, checking in, saying that he works on a team that offers services to young adults, experiencing what is often labeled psychosis. Um, we have Carolyn Smith. Hi, thank you for today's very important presentation. My name is Carolyn. I'm a peer facilitator of a new Hearing Voices self-help support group here in Australia. Hmm. Pretty cool that we have mm -hmm. have you on, Carolyn, mm -hmm. all the way from Australia. Um, must be pretty. What time of day? Late. Early. Early, early tomorrow. Early morning. Yeah. <laughs> early morning. Um, I have my own lived experience of recovery, and I am a carer for my sister who has diagnosis of mental health. I, I now know there is 
hope of recovery for all with this model. And especially now, I am also finding out about recovery dialogue. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your comment. Um, we also have a question. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. This is Val. I'm just wondering if, if Dan can make available on the website the, um, the documentation that helps one to start a dialogue so that people like Carolyn can, can use that to get started herself. Hmm. Oh, right. yeah. Yeah, I'd be glad to do that. It's a very good suggestion. Yeah, it's a, the, the 12 points that you were mentioning that um, <clears throat> we worked out at uh, Riverside, sure. Yeah, and just the whole six principles of dialogue, you know, I think it's a great um, document for people to have to get started. Sure. Yeah. No, and we'll also, we did, have a question. we did have uh, multiple questions about how how we can bring this to our area. And um, we we have a, we actually have a video that you can uh, purchase on our website, powertoyou.org, uh, from our store, that is a training video about how to start recovery dialogues. So you're welcome to, uh, to go to our website, purchase that video. Um, you're also welcome to contact us. Our, the contact information is right here. We really do want to hear from you. Um, and if you want to bring us to where you are at, um, this is this is a part of our grant work. Uh, so um, this is this is what we this is what we want to do. So uh, please contact us, and we can discuss bringing uh, you know having us actually come out and and help you to do this as well. Um, we uh, are actually probably could do some of it through Skype too. We haven't oh. yet, but at least um, presenting uh, to you know the small groups at first, where there's some distance involved. Um, yeah. So that that's another option, I would say. Yeah, especially with some of the long distances that we need to travel in our country. <laughs> uh, yeah. The, uh, yeah. The, the uh, technology can be can be great. So we we definitely have access to Skype or go to meeting those types of things. So we can we can work that out. Um, oh, and this is a very related question to that. Uh, Stephen asks, what are the best steps to take to introduce recovery dialogue to a public mental health community agency? Mm. Yeah. Well, I could say a word about that. And um, uh, the a relationship building is so, so important. So uh, finding uh, someone who's values, um, who values the, the recovery approach uh, within the administration is critical. Um, Jackie Descharm has been very important. The, the previous administrator also very important uh, because then they can advocate for that at an administrative level. And uh, Val uh, was very important in her position as recovery coordinator for the region. Um, so I would first try to um, uh, educate and, um, and, and win over, if, if it's necessary, the, um, uh, some of the people who are most interested and most inclined. It only takes, takes a few people to, to really get the, the ball rolling. And then, uh, and then just plan a, uh, a dialogue. Um, it, it, it probably is helpful to have, you know, to look at the video and also you could, could talk with us. We could give you enough perhaps orientation to do it with another person. It's always good to do two people, um, to do a group. And, um, and we could uh, talk people through, um, you know, doing a first group. Uh, the other thing is to bring, you know, one of us in uh, to talk or just talk over the phone with an administrator and say that, you know, uh, I, I think I could volunteer Val, but she'd have to, you know, be, uh, be open to it herself. Somebody who's been doing it in a hospital or, you know, I, I've done it out in the community. So they, they get some reassurance, to know that it's, it has been used other places. <clears throat> 
I don't know, Val, do you have a comment on that, how to best introduce this to, um, uh, to a new system? Well, I think that you hit all the uh, important points. It really does, however, have to begin with a relationship, that yeah. there has to be someone in leadership within the organization that you can talk to and yeah. express your ideas. Because mm. if you don't have the support from the top down, it's very difficult to sustain. Yeah, actually, I'll give a quick example of, <clears throat> of how we didn't do that initially at Riverside, um, and, and it almost, um, and almost uh, derailed us. So I was, just, I was in one division of Riverside, Val was in another, and, and we started just setting up these groups within the, the divisions. And, but there was an overall administration. It's also a very big organization, over a thousand employees. And one of the, the key administrators had um, came and attended one of them that we were doing. And at one moment, uh, one of the peers in a very respectful uh, fashion said, you know, sometimes I think a peer can reach a person um, who's, you know, a client or a consumer in a way that it's difficult for a professional to reach them. They, they sometimes can talk about their dreams or their goals with a peer in a different sort of fashion. And, oh my goodness, one of the providers sort of, you know, said, uh, really? And the administrator afterwards came up to me and said, I, I, I didn't realize that was what you all were talking about. <laughs> and... So I had to really do a presentation to our top leadership. Um, it, uh, Val, it was, you probably remember that. Uh, it was Scott and there were four others. And, <laughs> and, and they, they were like, well, we've been supporting these, but we didn't realize, you know, that you were supporting that the peers sometimes could do things that, that clinicians couldn't. <laughs> and I said, yeah, well, that's, that is sort of what we're doing, but you know, we'll, Let's we'll do one for the administrators. That's what we had to do. Um, I don't. Were you there, Val, when we did the one for the administrators? Their own. I was. Yes, Dan. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you were. <laughs> and that was that was a, another way to uh, to win over you know administration. And and it luckily it worked out. And they said, oh, I, I see. You know, uh, learning about other points of view is valuable, and we'll continue to support it now. <laughs> But it was almost the end for a while. <laughs> so getting, I'm just endorsing what Val is saying, get top level administration on board, um, educated, perhaps even do a, a um, uh, sort of a model uh, with them is another, another important point. You know, I have just a, a very brief, uh, this wasn't a top administrator, but it was a program director of a mental health clinic where I conducted my first recovery dialogue in the community after mm -hmm. Dan's training. And this program director, who was a clinician, agreed to start coming to recovery dialogue. And I think in the beginning, she was maybe holding her nose a little bit, doing it just because. Mm -hmm. Never did miss a recovery mm -hmm. dialogue. Mm -hmm. Because with a short amount of time, she realized that she, she was sitting with a group of people that if she hadn't shed her hat that day, she would mm. have considered patients. But mm. in recovery dialogue, she considered them friends. Mm. She admitted after about six months of coming to recovery dialogue that she learned more about recovery in six months than she had learned in 20 years of providing uh, clinical services to people. Oh, get her to write that up. Yeah, well, that's a great testimony. It was because she was sitting in an environment where she didn't have to fix anything no. or fix anybody. Her no. job was merely to listen, to be with, heart mm. to heart. Mm, wonderful. Yeah. Find her. Get her to write. Well, yeah. <laughs> well um, this has been a great conversation, and it went really fast. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, as I said, the, the medium is not ideal, the webinar medium, but you can see, I think, 
the power of recovery dialogues and we have lots of comments coming in like thank you so much for this fabulous presentation i will definitely be on a quest to learn more megan mills lead peer coordinator from Tulum County Behavioral Health Enrichment Center. I'm not sure what state that is, but. Um, Probably uh, Virginia. Can you do a evaluation at the end of this, um, uh, Arts? Is there a opportunity for people to give us a grade? Uh, please, please email us your evaluations to info for at power to you dot org. Um, and we, yeah, we definitely want to hear uh, your experience. Um, we're not, we're not, weren't able to get to all your questions. Um, so if you have a question as well mm -hmm. or a comment, please also send those to us. Um, and we will, we will get back to you. We're very good at responding to people. So we, we want to hear from you. You can also call us with, at that phone number, 1-800-POWER-TO-YOU. Uh, power to you. Um, so, uh, we want to we want to thank you for attending the webinar today. We also uh, want to thank all the panelists um, and uh, for for their presentations today. Um, so thank you very much, and that is the end of the webinar. Any any closing thoughts from the panelists? I'm glad that you. Help put this together, Arts. Good job as a um, as a chair, and um, and and for the Worcester um, uh, Recovery and Hospital. I'm so pleased that you all are doing what you're doing, and hope that we can get emotional CPR there soon too. We're going to push that, Dan, and and Patrick had something he wanted to say. We just, you know, we are open to doing uh, this again. So if there's enough enthusiasm where people say, well, could we do another webinar to learn a little bit more, we would be open to uh, another 90 minutes. Wonderful. Patrick? Oh, Val just said what I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I was actually thinking that, too. I was thinking mm -hmm. there's, a, there's probably a lot more um, conversation to be had. So if we did have a, a follow-up webinar, um, I think it could focus more on the dialogue part of it the, the, from, between all the participants. Um, so, um, yeah. So if they, people want that, that's another thing to right. email Please. us about. Yes, let us know if that's what you want. Um, let Samson know too. Yeah. Let Samson know. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you all, and and enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank bye. you.